Welcome and thank you to everyone for joining us here for this virtual George Talks with uh, the Honourable Dr Andrew Lee. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anthony Rogers, I'm Professor of Global Health at the George Institute for Global Health. Um, and before we start today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet. Today I'm presenting from Sydney and acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, in today's George talk, it's a great pleasure to welcome Andrew Lee. Um, Andrew is the Shadow Assistant Minister for Treasury and Charities, Federal Member for Fenner in the ACT and formerly a Professor of Economics at ANU. He's got degrees in arts and law from University of Sydney and a PhD in public policy from Harvard University. Uh, he's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Social Sciences and a past recipient of the Young Economist Award, a prize given every two years um, by the Economics, Economic Society of Australia for the best economist under 40 years of age. Um, and Andrew walks the talk. Um, he's used randomized trials to market test alternative titles for his books on Google Ads. He's randomized whether or not to wear a tie when giving lectures and to see if it affects his ANU student feedback. Um, he might give us the answer to that result uh, in, in his talk. Um, and he's published seven books in the last decade, uh, most recently Innovation and Equality, How to Create a Future That's More Star Trek Than Terminator. Um, and he'll be talking to us today about his 2018 book, Random Easters, How Radical Research Has Changed Our World. Um, so we'll be dedicating a good chunk of time to questions and answers from the audience um, after Andrew's talk and after a few um, questions for that, that I'll, I'll be asking Andrew. Um, so I encourage you to think about um, questions you might want to ask and start present, uh, putting them through the chat box. But for now, I'll hand over to Andrew Lee. Welcome. Thanks so much, Anthony. And uh, thank you to all of you who've taken the time to join us today. Uh, Anthony, just as you uh, acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, let me acknowledge the Ngunnawal people and whose lands in which I'm coming to you today. Uh, in Reconciliation Week, it's extraordinarily important that we do this. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk about randomised trials. Uh, I've got to say that there's no better invitation that could uh, come into my inbox uh, than the opportunity to talk about a subject on which I'm extraordinarily passionate. Uh, to the extent to which I have one big idea on social policy, one big idea on education policy, uh, yeah, one big idea on industry policy when it comes to that, uh, it's that we should expand randomised trials. Uh, I don't think they're perfect, but I think they can be uh, advanced in a whole lot of new areas. So let me start with the story. In 2013, a group of Finnish researchers published the results of a randomised trial of a menisectomy. A meniscectomy, as you may well know, is an operation on a torn meniscus. Uh, it is performed millions of times a year, uh, making it the most common orthopaedic procedure in countries like the United States and Australia. But this study was somewhat different to previous uh, meniscectomy studies that had been done. It was based on what's known as sham surgery. In a sham surgery trial, patients agree upfront that they will be randomised either to receive the actual surgery or else to be put under anaesthetic, to be played easily, easy listening music for the duration of the operation, but not to have the operation itself performed. Uh, the incision will be sewn up and they, they'll never know whether they actually got the, uh, the, the meniscectomy. And the results were pretty, pretty striking. There was no statistically significant difference, the researchers found, between those who'd received meniscectomies and those who'd received sham surgery. Not everyone was pleased by the result. Uh, an editorial in the journal Arthroscopy thundered that the results were ludicrous. Their reasoning went as follows. They said that because no mentally sound patients would consent to taking part in a randomized trial, a sham surgery trial, uh, the results couldn't be generalized to mentally healthy patients. Uh, while the arthroscopy editorial uh, was uh, both insulting to the patients and betrayed a somewhat strange model of how they thought your head affected your knee, it did indicate uh, the challenges that sham surgery has faced. Sham surgery randomised trials 
are increasingly demonstrating that many of our most common surgical procedures don't seem to do better uh, than alternative, the alternative of sham surgery. And that perhaps in many cases, physical therapy may well be better for a significant number of patients. Uh, one study found that the placebo effect in surgery uh, is larger than almost any other field of medicine. Uh, after receiving surgery, three quarters of patients feel better. Uh, but in about half the cases, the improvement in how well they feel is just as good if they'd gotten sham surgery than if they'd received regular surgery. Randomized trials in medicine have a strong lineage. Uh, they go back to the work of James Lind, who was a 31-year-old surgeon in 1747, uh, did a, conducted a randomized trial of the various treatments for scurvy. There were a whole lot of theories about scurvy and he put them to the test, taking pairs of sailors uh, who had contracted scurvy and giving them vinegar or guts, or in one case of two unfortunate men, salt water. But those who received citrus recovered very quickly uh, and Lynn's research was quickly published. Unfortunately, and this is a lesson for other randomisters, his theory was complete hocus pocus. And so it took the better part of half a century before the results of uh, citrus on curing scurvy uh, had been accepted by the, by the British Navy. Then again, they did come early enough that uh, uh, when uh, English and French uh, ships met at the Battle of Trafalgar, uh, the English were uh, taking citrus while the French and Spanish weren't. And so it wasn't just tactics, uh, but also the benefits of a randomised trial. Uh, that gave Britain the decisive edge. Randomised trials were also used by Ambrose Paré for his work in treating battlefield burns. Uh, Randomised trials showed in the early 1800s that bloodletting was not a successful uh, approach to curing diseases, a result that sadly came just a moment too late for medicine, which had by then named one of its top journals, The Lancet, a name that persists to this very day. Uh, the uh, work of Brad Austin Bradford Hill uh, in uh, Britain saw tuberculosis tested through randomised trials in the post-war years. Uh, when the polio vaccine came out, 600,000 American children were part of a randomised trial to test whether or not it worked. It was successful and was rolled out to millions of Americans the following year. Uh, as COVID-19 treatments and vaccines are emerging, uh, we're very quickly seeing them going into randomised trials. That is the standard by which the world is testing uh, the potential treatments uh, for COVID-19. Uh, I've used randomised the results of randomised trials frequently in, in my own life. Uh, I used to take a, a daily multivitamin tablet until I read a synthesis of the literature on longevity uh, can, connected with taking supplements of vitamins A, C and E and discovered, much to my surprise, that if anything, the correlation was negative. Uh, so not wanting to send myself to an early grave, I stopped taking the daily multivitamin. Uh, I used to take uh, fish oil tablets based on a small scale randomized trial published at the turn of the century. Uh, but after larger scale randomized trials of fish oil supplements were uh, published, uh, I realized that taking extracts of uh, anchovies on a daily basis uh, didn't seem to have any impact on my health. So I dropped the daily fish oil tablet too. Uh, I'm a marathon runner and so I'm affected by the uh, randomised trial conducted on uh, competitors who just finished the Melbourne, Sydney and Gold Coast marathons, uh, which asked a random group of them to wear compression socks for a couple of weeks and then invited them back to see how they did on the treadmill. Those randomly assigned compression socks recovered faster and so I wear compression socks after a big race. As uh, Anthony mentioned, I've used randomised trials to test titles of new books. Uh, my book, Battlers and Billionaires, had a title which was devised by my mum, uh, but my publisher thought the title Fair Enough was far better. We tested both on randomised trials of Google Ads, discovered my mum's title had eight times the click-through rate of my editors, uh, and my editor graciously conce conceded to the uh, data. Uh, in terms of the uh, tie experiment that I've spoken to you, uh, it is ironic that I'm wearing a tie when I'm speaking to you today, because when I conducted randomised trials on students at ANU, 
asked them to rate the lecture and randomly wearing ties on Sundays and not wearing them on others, there was absolutely no detectable difference. Turns out, uh, this may not be a surprise to many who teach, uh, that uh, whether your students like or don't like the material has little to do with whether you've tied a bit of cloth around your neck beforehand. Randomised trials are being used uh, to revamp social policy. Uh, in Melbourne, a group of uh, researchers uh, with the Sacred Heart Mission uh, conducted a randomised trial on the Journeys to Social Inclusion program, uh, an active caseworker support program uh, targeting people who had been sleeping rough for a decade or more. Uh, they received intensive assistance uh, and initially those who missed out on the treatment uh, were angry and frustrated. Uh, there was, according to the researchers, uh, more than one who said F you when they were told that they'd been put into the control group. But two years later, when the follow-up came, uh, there appeared to be no impact of the program uh, on people's propensity to have a job, uh, no impact on their uh, mental well-being. Uh, those participants were more likely to uh, have a stable home because that was essentially part of the intervention, uh, but uh, also more likely to have been picked up for, for a crime. Uh, because it turns out when you've got a stable home, it's easier for the police to find you. Uh, the research shouldn't be regarded as dispiriting or suggesting that we can't solve these problems, but it does indicate for a deeply disadvantaged group of people who've been potentially sleeping rough and using drugs for uh, much of their life, uh, that the best prospect is not to sail straight into employment, uh, but to find some part-time volunteering and some modest reconnecting with family. Social change is hard as the randomisters have reminded us. Uh, in uh, the uh, uh, United States, uh, work with prisoners has suggested that randomised trials can have a significant, uh, suggested that cognitive behavioural therapy uh, can have a significant positive effect. Uh, rather than Freudian style therapy, which goes back into people's uh, childhood memory, cognitive behavioural therapy focuses on breaking down automatic patterns of behaviour, encouraging participants to think and then act. And it seems to be extraordinarily successful, not only for reducing recidivism, but also for at-risk youths, preventing them from finding their way into jail in the first place. In international development, it's said that these days you can't go to a poor village without tripping over a random ester, as randomised trials have proliferated uh, across Africa and South Asia. Uh, they've tested uh, whether bed nets are uh, more likely to be used uh, if, they, uh, uh, if, if participants pay something for them than if they're assigned free, a common theory in the 1990s. It turns out that uh, co-payments make people no more likely to use a bed net, but not surprisingly, less likely to get one in the first place. Things that are free uh, tend to be more likely to be uh, taken up than things for which people have to pay. And so that shifted the uh, World Bank's policy on distribution of bed nets. Uh, the uh, Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB and malaria uh, has been bed netting Africa, uh, handing out free bed nets as a result of this seminal randomised trial. In microcredit, uh, the randomisters have shown that microcredit perhaps isn't the magic bullet that uh, Muhammad Yunus and Bill uh, Clinton have, were suggesting at the turn of the century. Uh, participants in microcredit uh, seem to uh, increase their savings a little, increase their self-esteem a little, uh, but the rates of new business formation are much more modest than we might have thought beforehand. Increasingly now, development researchers are looking at savings programs uh, as much as credit programs as a way of dealing with uh, uh, the problem of underdevelopment. Uh, you would have, uh, you, you'd be aware that uh, last year, the Nobel Prize in Economics went to three randomisters, uh, Esther Duflo, Abhijit Banerjee, and Michael Kramer, uh, who've done vital work uh, expanding uh, our understanding of development. And increasingly, what they've been doing uh, is using randomised trials, not just to test programs, but to test theories. One of the really important things in my own discipline of economics is our ability to align our empirical tests with our theoretical knowledge. One of the great things about randomised trials is that it is much easier to construct a randomised trial that precisely meets your theory. So, done well, Randomised trials aren't just a way of learning whether people are more likely to open letters in blue envelopes than red envelopes, but help us to understand deeper questions of human behaviour, an insight that I believe 
applies to other social sciences as well. We're seeing randomized trials being employed in my own area of politics, uh, most famously uh, when he was running for re-election as Texas governor. Rick Perry agreed to work with a group of randomisters to randomize his radio and TV ad buys uh, across different markets in Texas. Uh, it turned out that his ads worked, uh, but only in the very short term. So people polled after in a market that had been saturated with more Perry ads uh, were more likely to be favorable towards Rick Perry, uh, but the effect faded out within a fortnight, uh, suggesting that uh, if political advertising uh, does work, uh, it, it, it's only uh, an ephemeral effect. Uh, and uh, we're seeing huge numbers of randomized trials uh, in business. Oh, there goes my meeting notes. Let me just slot them over behind. There we go. We're seeing huge numbers of randomized trials in business. Uh, it, uh, Amazon now says that uh, uh, just about every pixel on their homepage has been evaluated through a randomized trial. Uh, companies like Humana and Lyft are using randomized trials uh, in order to improve employee satisfaction uh, in order to target marketing programs. Uh, if you want to know why about half of all published prices end in the number nine, uh, you can thank the randomisters uh, who've shown that we're more likely to buy things that end in the, end in the number nine uh, than we are to buy cheaper things at cheaper prices. Uh, $39 uh, gets a higher consumer take up than $38. Go figure. So randomized trials are being used increasingly to uh, empower the, uh, the, the data, pe data people within organizations. Uh, as one uh, advocate of randomized trials put it, uh, if uh, uh, we have data, let's go with data. If all we have is opinions, let's go with mine. Uh, they, it said that the uh, randomisters uh, allow a shift towards uh, the evidence uh, and away from what's known as the HIPPO principle, the highest paid person's opinion. Uh, in which we simply defer to status rather than to evidence. Let me finish with a final story. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, successful business, uh, businessman uh, Blake McCoskey was visiting villages outside Buenos Aires. Uh, he was struck by seeing the condition of the children there and the fact that many of them were running around without shoes. And he determined to do something about it. McCoskey was only in his early 30s. He'd founded a number of successful startup businesses. And this time he decided to found a business that would be a social purpose enterprise. So he created Shoes for a Better Tomorrow, Tom's Shoes, with the business model that every time a person in an advanced country bought a pair of shoes, Tom's would provide a free pair of shoes to someone in a poor country, typically a child. After it had been running for nearly a decade, uh, McCoskey allowed a group of researchers to conduct a randomized trial to see whether or not uh, the allocation of free shoes was making a difference. Bruce Whitek led the, led the team and was surprised when he saw the results. Those who received free shoes uh, were a little more likely to wear them, uh, but they typically weren't going from barefoot to shoes, they were upgrading their shoes. Uh, participants were uh, no more likely to attend school uh, and had no uh, higher levels of well-being. Uh, in general, though, they had a greater sense of dependence on outsiders. So it's important to recognise what this finding meant. Uh, this wasn't a philanthropic add-on. Tom's Shoes didn't have uh, shoe giveaways bolted onto its program. This was the organisation's very raison d'etre. And Bruce Whitek's results were showing that it wasn't having the intended impact. But they didn't try and bury them. They encouraged publication and they worked with the researchers to amend their programs. Rather than giving out loafers, they moved to giving out sneakers, which allowed children to participate in sports. Rather than simply giving the shoes, uh, the shoes away, they're now working with communities to ensure that the parents have more of a say and to look at ways in which the shoes can be a reward for school attendance, building off other randomized trial research uh, that had shown that conditional cash transfer programs are a highly effective way of boosting student participation. As Bruce Whitek put it, uh, Tom's didn't try and bury the results, they tried to use them to build a better organization. If Tom's shoes can run randomized trials on their very business model, I think 
few businesses, few organisations, uh, few charities uh, and few governments have an excuse for not running randomised trials. Uh, we owe the uh, uh, success of randomised trials to medicine, but there are many parts of medicine which still are essentially randomised trial free. Plastic surgery, for example, uh, generally works on the, the principle of uh, the, an artisan principle, uh, that different people have different ways of fixing a nose uh, and they don't tend to do random assignment. That I suspect will change in the coming decades. Surgery too is increasingly open to randomised trials, although there are many surgeons that are, that are resisting the, uh, the move. Uh, and uh, advocates such as Peter Chung still find themselves uh, pushing up against resistance. Uh, but uh, I think randomised trials are one of the most powerful tools we have uh, for improving the world one coin toss at a time. Look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Andrew. That's a fascinating talk. And, um, and we will have a, a large number of questions. I think we've got about 170 people registered for this, for this talk. And so keep them coming through, but I'll take a uh, presenter's prerogative and ask you a few first. Um, on a personal note, perhaps to start off before we get into the content, um, you, your bio is so impressive. You're an MP, you write a book every year or two, you still publish academic papers and, and uh, receive grants, you run marathons, you host a podcast that's had a very interesting podcast, more than 100 episodes, you're a husband, a father of three. Uh, tell us a bit about your schedule, um, how, how you fit it all in, into the day. And, and maybe mention something that you failed at or found hard, um, something that will make you seem human to us. Please tell us <laughs> you've had a, a grant rejected or something like that. Uh, so Anthony, I, I fail at lots of things, but uh, one of them came in, in trying to uh, fit a few too many things in a couple of years ago. Uh, I was uh, deciding, I decided that uh, I could get away with shaving my sleep uh, a little and having naps in the afternoon, which, you know, in general is a good idea, but, um, but I think I, uh, I pushed a little further than I should, getting down to uh, uh, four, to, four to five hours a night uh, and uh, discovered by the end of the year uh, that the combination of sleeping short and training for the Chicago Marathon uh, had left me with a stress fracture. So I managed to run one of my worst marathon times uh, on a fractured pelvis in Chicago. And it was one of those illustrations that uh, sometimes you really can try and uh, squeeze too much in. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm much more careful with my sleep and diet these days than I, than, than, than I was. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just, I, I love writing. And so when I get spare time, I tend to uh, uh, pen a few words here and there. Uh, and uh, exercise is, uh, is, is the way in which um, I feel as though I'm set up for the day. So uh, my day started this morning at uh, uh, 5.30, zero degrees in Canberra, jumping on the bike and uh, heading out there, uh, around uh, for, for a uh, 35k bike ride, uh, which then makes me feel as though I've, I've done my exercise for the, for the rest of the day and uh, uh, there's, uh, there's no... Uh, there's 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 no, nothing no, no other challenge that can hit me that I won't be able to take on. Great, thanks, Andrew. Um, can I ask you? You mentioned in your book and you've mentioned in your podcast before. You see a particular role for charities and nonprofits in in trialing new interventions. Mm. Uh, you talked about the challenge for governments is people can expect them to just roll things out to everyone. Um, and whereas a charity or a non-profit, it can be justified to only rolling it out to some people in the context of a trial. Um, can you talk to us a bit more about that? What sort of role you see for organisations like the George and the other non-profits and, and research institutes that are on the call to, in helping evaluate new, new interventions? Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I think it's, it's that uh, uh, assumption of universality often makes it quite difficult for governments to randomly uh, trial their programs. Uh, governments might well worry that if they took a universal program and made it selective, uh, that uh, the recipients would, uh, would arc up. Uh, but if you're uh, providing a program like the Journey to Social Inclusion, I don't think there's any expectation that it will be universal. Uh, so this, this is something that uh, applies too if you're doing uh, after school programs, if you're providing uh, pr prisoner education, uh, if you're uh, offering uh, additional health care in disadvantaged communities. 
Um, you should always go through the appropriate ethics approvals, make sure that those who are implementing the program understand why you're randomizing, uh, because there's nothing surer to kill a randomized trial uh, than pe uh, people who are meant to be implementing it who decide that the control group deserves to get the, uh, the treatment as well. Uh, so you've got you've to have that broad buy-in uh, but once you've done that, I think there's enormous power for charities and not-for-profits uh, to expand the evidence base. Uh, you look at the uh, early childhood uh, programs, uh, Perry Preschool, Abbasidarian, and the Early Training Project, uh, all studies in the 1960s uh, done by small non-profits, uh, which completely revamped how we think about the role of early childhood education uh, in social disadvantage. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, in the last few months in Australia, the government's um, put in place probably some of the largest interventions ever by, by a government in this country. Um, do you know if any of those were randomised? And uh, if not, why not? I'm, I'm not aware of any of it that's, uh, that's been randomised. Uh, the uh, uh, closest I can give to an answer there uh, is when I was seconded to Treasury in 2008, 2009 in the global financial crisis, uh, and it was decided that the government would uh, roll out uh, cash payments to households uh, because of the way in which the payment system operated that couldn't be done simultaneously for all households. Um, so I proposed that uh, the tax office get a list of postcodes, randomise it uh, and allocate ba based on that, uh, that random list. Uh, that was done and so it was then possible for subsequent researchers uh, to do a household, uh, to uh, use household panel uh, certain data on expenditure and have a look at the share of the household payments that were spent compared to saved. Uh, and, uh, and so we're able to, to get a randomised trial in place in that instance. Uh, there's also other researchers who have used randomised trials of lotteries, such as the Vietnam War draft, uh, in order to learn something about the impact of military service on subsequent careers. So sometimes governments set up randomised trials, even when they're not trying to. Uh, but I don't think there's anything in the recent experience that's of that nature. Yeah, thanks. I, I see you, you did commission a report um, entitled Unleashing the Potential of Randomised Trials in Australian Governments. And that found that there'd only been 33 randomised trials in that space in Australia. And um, if you Google, Hans, if you search through Hansard, the word randomised is barely mentioned. And um, you, you've talked in your podcast about how about seven out of 10 politicians are supportive of more trials and think more will be done in the future. But the issue of fairness is, is a major one from them. Can you talk to us a little bit more about convincing your parliamentary colleagues about the, the need for more trials and what are some of the uh, the things that you think could be done in that sphere? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've always seen my role as a professor turned politician as acting as a bit of a conduit between the two worlds of academia and politics. Uh, you think of politics as the world of power and academics, uh, academia as the world of ideas and uh, to be a uh, conveyor belt between those two worlds is, uh, is one of the roles that I want to play. Um, so I'm constantly uh, banging on about randomised trials to, uh, to colleagues. Uh, looking for opportunities in which uh, they might be put into place. Uh, I'm encouraged by the growth of behavioural insights teams, uh, both at the federal and New South Wales level, uh, which uh, are in, in some sense a gateway drug for randomised trials. Uh, as one person put it, uh, when they turned up uh, at, uh, in government and started talking about randomised trials a decade ago, uh, people shook their head. Uh, then they turned up and started talking about beha behavioural economics to be tested using randomised trials, and people said, oh, yes, tell me more. Uh, so uh, these behavioural insight teams are, are an important way of expanding randomised trials uh, and have been providing a, a lot of new knowledge uh, as well as uh, returning uh, uh, many more benefits to the taxpayer than their cost. Uh, to take just one example from the federal uh, beta team, uh, they conducted a, a really important randomised trial, sending letters to uh, doctors who were super subscribers, super prescribers uh, of antibiotics, uh, which managed to sharply reduce uh, antibiotic overprescribing uh, by, the, by those doctors. Uh, a huge benefit, not only in terms of uh, reduced outlays for those particular doctors uh, prescribing uh, 
uh, medicines their patients didn't need, uh, but also in terms of reducing antibiotic resistance, which is a real challenge in the community. Great, thanks. Yeah, one of our um, one of our audience panels has mentioned this. Um, governments around the world have. Uh, Start, incorporated behavioral economics units, um, but there aren't that many focusing in health. Um, what mm. do you think are the priority questions that related to health that uh, should be used by the Australian government beta unit? Any other pressing questions that you're aware of? Well, right now it's the uh, question of uh, getting a COVID vaccine. Uh, nothing is more important in terms of uh, getting the economy going. The uh, uh, and, and getting unemployment back down. Uh, we're not going to be able to have major sporting events, major arts events, uh, uh, flying back in action uh, until people are secure that, uh, that we've, we've dealt with COVID. Uh, and in the longer term, I think we also want to think about uh, whether or not there's broader treatments, uh, things such as uh, broader spectrum antivirals, uh, which could be developed, uh, which would help fight the next pandemic uh, or more worryingly still, uh, the next genetically engineered disease. Uh, so the, that's, that's something I've been worrying about a lot. Uh, there's also the, uh, the broad question of uh, preventive health. Uh, preventive health is to a large extent behavioural economics. Uh, no one uh, is in any doubt that uh, uh, eating well, exercising regularly, not smoking and not drinking too much, not driving your car too fast, all of these are healthy things to do. Uh, but because we have, have uh, high discount rates and sometimes hyperbolic discounting where we uh, excessively discount tomorrow compared to, uh, compared to, uh, to other dates, uh, then we tend not to do those things. So overcoming hyperbolic discounting is, uh, to me, the, uh, the, the core of uh, uh, public health uh, and randomised trials have a, a lot to recommend themselves in how we uh, assess those preventive health measures. Absolutely, and particularly the behavioural economics approaches to that. Yeah, I mean, do you yeah. see other areas on this, Anthony? You think about these areas this this hard? Oh, exactly. I mean, so much of what we we do focus in this prevention space is trying to address that issue of uh, of perceptions of risk and coping with discounting and doing things now that will benefit in the future. So I, I mm. think we've actually in health have got a lot to learn from what's been done in those areas um, outside of health. Hmm. Um, keep a few questions related to, to the current pandemic. Uh, I noted you, you wrote in a 2010 paper about output contractions, which is economic speak for declines in GDP, at that time due to, due to adverse weather shocks that, that internationally that tends to promote pro-democratic change hmm. uh, in, in governments. Do you think that might be a silver lining in the coming years for this particular set of contractions that are going to happen? Uh, yes, well, this is work I did with uh, Paul Burke uh, at the tail end of my time as an Australian National University professor. Uh, and the theory goes back to, uh, to, to Egypt, uh, where uh, pharaohs uh, quickly discovered when the Nile didn't flood uh, that uh, people thought the gods were telling them to uh, change the ruler. And it turns out that that pattern still exists. Uh, if you're a, a dictator, uh, you want uh, steady economic growth. Uh, and if your economy is highly dependent on agriculture and a drought comes along, uh, you're more likely to be ousted. Uh, so I would expect we'll see some increase in uh, the oustings of uh, dictators over, uh, over, over years to come. Uh, we may also, though, see uh, a surge of uh, populists coming into power. There's a commensurate trend, which we didn't look at in the paper, but which has been since documented, uh, that crises tend to be grist to the mill for, uh, for populists, uh, particularly populists who are out of power before the crisis takes place. Uh, so on net, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is going to be good for democracy, uh, but let's keep our, keep our fingers crossed. Mm. Thanks, thanks. And, and you, you tweeted recently that you note how recessions can exacerbate inequality, um, which always has bad implications for health. And, and what do you think should be done to, to mitigate those effects in Australia now that we are in a recession? 
Yeah, I mean, the the general effect of uh, recessions on health turns out to be counterintuitive. Uh, it's uh, it's actually positive on average uh, ac across the advanced countries over the course of the la last uh, a couple of a couple of generations. Um, that's because while recessions do have very bad impacts on the health of those who lose their jobs, uh, they also lead to a fall in hours among those who don't lose their jobs. Uh, people are more likely to exercise in a, in a recession. Uh, the, uh, the, there's a big drop in car accidents, which is a significant source of mortality, uh, and uh, heart attacks seem to fall. Uh, none of that suggests that you want a recession. Uh, it's, uh, it's simply, it's simply uh, a statistical effect that we observe. Uh, and it may well be that in the current downturn, given that this is a downturn caused by a health crisis, uh, that we don't in fact see that uh, pattern that we've, we've observed in previous economic slumps uh, of a modestly positive effect uh, on the health of those who, uh, who don't lose their jobs. Uh, I think it's, it's absolutely vital to recognise the distributional effect of uh, downturns. Uh, those who uh, uh, lose their jobs tend to be the last, last hired. Uh, so disproportionately, uh, we're going to see uh, younger Australians, people with less education, uh, people with le less experience, uh, people with disabilities, Indigenous Australians, uh, losing their jobs. Uh, these, these groups uh, will see higher unemployment rates, uh, and those who are already unemployed before the crisis will have almost no chance of breaking into the formal labour market. Uh, so bringing unemployment down is, is not just a, a issue of growth, it's also a question of equity. Uh, the, one of the best ways of, of ensuring that we have uh, greater equality in Australia uh, is to get the unemployment rate down, uh, not just to 5% where it was beforehand, but, uh, but ideally uh, lower than that, uh, down to uh, the sorts of levels that we saw in uh, Britain, the US or Germany uh, at the start of this year. I think we can do an, an awful lot better on unemployment uh, and I think we need to, uh, to, to, be, to be focusing on job creation for the most disadvantaged uh, and at the same time also focusing on skills acquisitions for the most disadvantaged. Uh, this is no time to be preventing people from taking on higher education. Uh, we ought to be seeing a massive increase in uh, domestic students attending Australian universities next year. Universities have the capacity because they'll have fewer international students and students have the capacity because there just aren't the same number of jobs out there. Uh, so uh, making, making use of this, uh, of this crisis in order to uh, boost education, particularly among those who'd be their fir the first in their families to attend university, uh, has got to be a top priority. Thanks, Andrew. And um, we've got a, a bunch of questions going through, um, but before I go to those, I thought I'd just turn the tables and ask you the question, the set questions that you ask all of your podcast hosts, and I'd encourage everyone to listen. There's some fascinating um, answers to these questions in Andrew's podcast, but we'll just do a quick rapid fire of your favourite six questions. Um, what advice would you give to your teenage self? Think about what the world needs from you, not what you want from the world. Interesting. Um, what did you used to believe that you, you no longer do? Uh, that it was all about hard work and luck didn't matter. <laughs> Just, um, when are you most happy? When I'm, when I'm running and uh, running faster than I thought I would. Uh, there's this uh, concept of love lock day, this idea of... Uh, speed and effort of uh, grace while feeling your, your heart's about to, uh, to, to leap out of your chest. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but it is a, a, a beautiful sweet spot while exercising. And You're in of course, when I'm with my kids and my, and my wife. In the zone. Um, what's the most important thing you do to keep healthy physically and mentally? Exercise. Same again. Excellent. Uh, any guilty pleasures? Uh, I, uh, I probably uh, exercise a bit too much. So exercise is both the most important thing and a guilty pleasure. Uh, you need to exercise 20 minutes a day. You don't need to exercise an hour and 20 minutes a day. Yeah, yeah. I remember talking to an addiction specialist uh, who was uh, a physician and he was saying this, 
his classic question was to find out how addicted people he's asked them well i've transported you to another city what's the first thing you think about um and often it's you know where i'm going to get my fix of heroin or whatever and for many exercise people it's okay where am i going to go for my run um, it's, a, it's a similar thing yeah. guilty as charged <laughs> Um, and lastly, which personal experience has most shaped your life? Oh, my folks. Uh, my mum and dad, Barbara and Michael Lee, uh, were just role model parents. Um, with that combination of pushing, pushing you to do your best, but also uh, be, always being there, surrounding, surrounding my brother Tim and I with, with love and laughter. Uh, that, uh, that, that role model of parenting is one that I attempt to live up to with my three boys and uh, fall short of pretty much every day. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. So um, I'll, I'll move it out now to uh, the questions that are coming thick and fast from the audience. Um, one here saying the government's response to COVID-19 has been clearly evidence-based and unashamedly relied upon medical advice. Um, how can your enthusiasm for evidence be shared with other politicians to try to continue this respect for science and evidence into other important issues like climate change? Yeah, I think it's a, a really salient point right now. You think of what the Amazon recommendation engine would be saying to uh, some of my coalition colleagues. Uh, if you like what medical scientists have to say, uh, we think you might also like what climate scientists have to say. Uh, increasingly, I think it's just got to become untenable for uh, the government of Australia to essentially deny the science uh, in a context in which Australia is being hurt by climate change more than any other advanced country. Uh, you know, our biggest tourism asset, the Great Barrier Reef, stands to, uh, to, to be bleached to a point at which tourists won't want to visit it. Uh, we, uh, we've experienced bushfires this year uh, that burned 21% uh, of the temperate forests on the eastern coast. Uh, a normal year burns 2%. Uh, my own city of Canberra didn't get 40 degree days for a 25 year period through the 70s, 80s and 90s. 40 degree days are now just normal in summer. We get uh, multiple, multiple 40 degree days. Uh, and the impact of extreme weather events, sea level rise, uh, unseasonably hot weather uh, will continue to hurt us. Uh, the scientists have been warning of this for literally a generation now. Uh, and so Australia needs to be playing a leading role rather than doing as we so shamefully did in Madrid last year under uh, Angus Taylor, uh, going along and helping to drag back climate action. Uh, we ought to be at the vanguard of action uh, because it's in our interest to redu reduce carbon emissions. Um, and talking about the science about the processes of global warming is, is probably something we ought to do more as, as politicians. Uh, I've been reading a lot about climate change over, over the, uh, the, the last couple of months, um, getting my, uh, my head around uh, some of the really catastrophic risks that, uh, that climate change could, uh, could pose through books like Mark Linus's Six Degrees. Um, and, uh, and that's something that, uh, that ought to be more prominent in the public conversation. And it's interesting that point we touched on recently about the issue around discounting. If you ignore science and climate change, it's a, it's a future risk that's in the distant. And whereas if you ignore the science on COVID-19, your numbers are going to go up in a couple of weeks. And uh, it just brings you mu that much more to account. Yes, that's right. Yeah, future challenges are always harder to make salient, although climate change is, uh, is, is hitting us pretty, pretty hard a whole lot sooner than, uh, than, than people expected. Um, another question here, um, should we, could we randomly allocate our Prime Minister um, or the length of the parliamentary term or perhaps the salaries and benefits politicians receive um, just to see if they can live off salary of a benefit recipient? Um, that will be your most challenging trial to get, uh, get going, but uh, what do you think about that? It would indeed, yes. So uh, I haven't seen a randomised trial of politicians' pay, but there is a quasi-experiment uh, that's been done uh, using variation across US municipalities, another one that's been done using quasi-random variation in uh, political remuneration across Brazilian municipalities. And both of the studies suggest that uh, politicians' pay uh, makes little difference to the incumbents. Um, the so-called efficiency wage theory uh, applies to politicians as to other occupations. 
Um, if I double your pay, it's unlikely you work twice as hard. Uh, but there does seem to be an impact in terms of who runs, uh, specifically uh, candidates who run with, uh, under a system with uh, higher remuneration in Brazil or the United States um, tend to be better qualified, more ideologically aligned with their voters, uh, and more women run under those circumstances uh, than when the pay is lower. Uh, perhaps uh, reflecting uh, the greater responsiveness of, of, of women to uh, variables such as tax rates, where we know that uh, female labour supply is, uh, is more elastic uh, with respect to tax rates than male labour supply. Excellent, thanks. Um, do you think there's any examples from other countries' governments where they're using randomised trials um, well? Um, any overseas examples we can learn from? Yeah, I mean, there's a uh, huge amount being, uh, being done around the world. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting initiatives, I think, in the United States is uh, the Arnold Foundation, which is uh, now running a low-cost randomised trials competition. Uh, it kicked off under the Obama White House, uh, but the Trump White House weren't keen to continue it. Um, so Arnold uh, took it up on their own. Uh, and initially, they were funding a, a fixed number of projects, uh, looking for projects costing less than $200,000 and able to be completed in less than a year. Uh, and then they, uh, they discovered that they could actually fund all of the projects that their assessment team said cleared the bar. Uh, so now that's, uh, the, the, it's, it's essentially an, an uncapped funding, uh, funding system. Uh, and demonstrating that randomised trials don't have to cost, cost millions and take decades, uh, that they can involve straight for, straightforward tweaks. Uh, you can use administrative data rather than more expensive follow-up surveys in order to find out what worked. Uh, and then you can, uh, recycle, you can implement the learnings very quickly. Now, I mentioned before the polio vaccine that was rolled out the following year. We'll expect the same out of COVID vaccines, but educational interventions can also be rolled out very quickly as well. Uh, so we need to get away from this idea that randomised trials are somehow uh, too big or too expensive to be done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you'll be talking to com converts here, but th there is a, a question from the audience. Do you think there's questions that, that aren't able to be answered um, with trials? There's a, a lovely British, British medical journal uh, spoof article, which is on randomised trials of parachutes. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the author... Uh, goes through and says, well, uh, I've searched the literature for randomised trials of whether or not putting on a parachute before jumping out of plane uh, works, uh, and I can find nothing whatsoever. Uh, all I find, uh, the author says, tongue in cheek, is mere observational studies, which we know to be low quality. Uh, so really, how can we be sure that jumping out of a plane with a parachute is going to save your life? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's very cute, and it's often cited by uh, those who say that randomised trials have no applicability. Uh, but against that, I'd put the fact that there are plenty of randomised trials looking at other aspects of parachute jumping. Uh, for example, a study out of Fort Benning showed that ankle bra braces uh, seem to significantly reduce the chance of injury uh, among US para uh, paratroopers. Uh, so we can't always randomly trial the biggest things, but there are aspects of big things that we might want to randomly trial. Uh, for example, whether or not to do fiscal stimulus in 2008, 2009, uh, was not up to, uh, to, to a randomised trial. Uh, but being able to randomly roll out those, uh, those payments uh, across postcodes taught us something about their impact. So often there's opportunities for small-scale randomisation uh, within larger programs. And I think you've talked a lot about the, the potential for, for randomly uh, randomising the stage at which things are rolled out um, yes. as a more politically yes. acceptable... Route. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So one of the, one of the uh, best known randomised trials in the world is uh, uh, the Progressa randomised trial of conditional cash transfers in Mexico, uh, which uh, the government had announced it would roll out uh, across 500 Mexican villages. Researchers persuaded them to randomise which villages received it in year one and year two, because they couldn't do all villages in the first year. So 200 villages uh, get, 250 villages get in the first year, 250 villages get it in the second year. And in the at the end of the first year, the second set of villages are the control group for the first set, first set of villages. Turns out to have a huge impact on kids' school attendance. Uh, and the program, unlike many other Mexican social programs, survives the transition of government. Uh, the new government decided to rebadge it uh, Progressa as Oportunidades, uh, but it, uh, it lives uh, and now has been uh, extended to around 30 countries worldwide. 
Thanks. Um, another question coming in. Um, are you optimistic about the necessary big government spending, which will be helpful in supporting society and economy um, through the pandemic and its ongoing consequences? I think it's essential that we uh, support households at a time in which they can't work. Uh, it, uh, it would be unconscionable for a government to say, uh, you are not allowed to operate your business and we will give nothing to you to compensate for that. Uh, there's a social interest in us uh, engaging in social distancing. Uh, there's a huge community benefit from stopping the spread of this, uh, this disease, which has a fatality rate somewhere between half a percent and 2%. Uh, so we need to we need to have the shutdown, but we also need to ensure that people can live. Uh, and so providing that uh, that that uh, assistance is being critical. Uh, and that so that's the what's so called the job seeker part of it, where we've boosted uh, uh, assistance payments for those who are out of the labour force. Uh, but it's also important that we maintain the connections to the largest extent possible between firms and workers. Uh, so the job keeper program, the wage subsidy program that uh, business unions and labor advocated very strongly from the start of the, the start of the uh, shutdown until the government implemented it um, that job keeper program is really important in maintaining those connections between firms and workers uh, you can think of the economy as being a whole network of uh, uh, matched firms and, uh, and and workers that matching problem takes a whole lot of time to do uh, it's not obvious uh, whether who will be a good match for uh, for a particular firm once you break those matches, it takes a whole lot more time to, to remake them again, which is why on average unemployment falls uh, at half the pace that it rose. Uh, and that's why you, you wanna make sure that unemployment uh, doesn't, doesn't rise too far. Yeah, yeah. And I'd just like to talk a bit more about that, um, that issue you, you touched on there of these, these things that are getting implemented and there is uncertainty. And, and uncertainty, if you think about it, is it's at the heart of randomization. It's only ethical mm. to randomize when you're uncertain about something. To know about progress, you've got to find the most important uncertainty that you need to resolve. Um, but there's some real question, uh, challenges for uncertainty. Um, in, in the medical context, patients might not want to hear that their surgeon is actually uncertain about what the best operation to do. There's all sorts of pressures on the surgeon, for example, to, to um, not admit fully that degree of uncertainty to themselves. And it seems in politics, um, admitting uncertainty might be seen as a weakness that could be exploited. Mm. What do you think are the ways in which one can make that uncertainty um, explicit, but still act, act through it? Such a good question and one that I've been wondering about a lot. Um, it comes up before when I was talking about the uh, catastrophic risk of climate change. Uh, it is unlikely that te the temperature rise will be six degrees or more, but the possibility that would occur should give us the heebie-jeebies uh, and should shape our response. Uh, we don't know for sure that uh, there is going to be another pandemic uh, but the potential for it to arise means that we ought to, uh, to do something in advance. Somehow we seem to solve this problem in our everyday lives. Uh, most of us have home insurance. Most of us have insurance in case we damage another car. Uh, but uh, as, so, so as societies, we need to take on that notion of insurance in how we deal, deal with uh, uh, challenges. Uh, maybe the uh, solution comes out of uh, drawing analogies with sports, where many people are familiar with the notion that if the tournament starts off fair and it's between 20 teams, then every team has a 5% chance of, uh, of, of winning. Um, so put, put differently, uh, you have a 95% chance that your, uh, your team won't get over the line. Um, we need to do a better job in communicating uncertainty. And that probably uh, has a bit to do with how we teach statistics. Uh, I reckon school maths curricula could do with a little bit less trigonometry and a little bit more statistics and probability because it's so essential to how we think about problems, uh, not just in public policy, but also in, in business as well. Uh, and maybe in medicine, it's about uh, drawing those analogies to everyday life. Uh, David Spiegelhalter has a lovely book on risk in which he looks at the probabilities of uh, a whole lot of different unlikely events occurring from uh, dying in a plane crash 
where it turns out that you'd have to take a daily plane flight for 120,000 years to be odds on of dying in a, in a crash, uh, to uh, uh, having a, 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 a car crash, which is uh, uh, more like a 5% chance through the year, uh, though less than a 1% chance that you'll, that you'll be injured. Uh, so having some of those everyday probabilities as benchmarks when people are considering the risks of an operation uh, can be important. And David's done some really nice work uh, in helping cancer patients think through, uh, th think through risks uh, as they're approaching uh, potential treatments, uh, none of which are risk-free. Fascinating, yeah. That would be a very interesting thing to put into your um, educational trials, uh, introducing the concept of risk in the, in the mm. curriculum. Yeah. Um, another question that's come, come through just now, um, what's your thoughts on um, uh, meat and, and, and dairy eating in global warming and, and more broadly, how we can motivate politicians to adopt climate and public health policies um, I, I guess that the kind of um, persuading about the evidence from multiple prongs, what, what, what's your strategy on that front? Yeah, I mean, I certainly buy the evidence on uh, carbon emissions from uh, ruminants. Um, I know there's been some work done on how you can uh, reduce, uh, reduce emissions. So it turns out there's certain uh, feeds and certain uh, medications that, uh, that, that will reduce it. Uh, but overall, the effect seems to be pretty large. And uh, I, in my own life, I've reduced the amount of red meat I consume. Uh, I'm also struck by the number of uh, colleagues who are uh, uh, vegetarians. Uh, I won't name them, but uh, uh, at least uh, three members of the shadow cabinet that I know of are, uh, are vegetarians. Uh, and uh, in part, that's, a, uh, that's an environmental decision. Uh, so this is certainly something that we ought to talk about and uh, and be aware of, um, though uh, I think it's it's also something that needs to be balanced in the uh, in the broader portfolio of, uh, of the public conversation. Uh, if uh, if people think that uh, uh, dealing with climate change uh, means giving up their car and giving up their stake tomorrow, uh, then they may simply choose to do nothing, uh, which would be catastrophic. Fantastic. Well, th thanks so much, Andrew, for your time. I know we, we're just getting to the end now. And um, so uh, I'd really like to thank you on behalf of all the, the registrants for such a fascinating whirlwind tour of, of randomized trials and your incredible insight, not just in health, but across, across all sorts of disciplines. And so thank you so much for, for your time and input. I'm sure you'll have lots of people following you up after this uh, <laughs> with, with further well, it's ideas. A, it's a real Real pleasure, and thanks for the honour of uh, having me join you. I'm a, a great fan of the George Institute, as are so many Australians. And, and if there's people on the uh, on the call who'd like to be in touch, I'm pretty easily found at the modestly named andrewlee.com, which has uh, all of the, uh, the the podcasts and uh, and, and blogs and uh, all of, all of the other good stuff. If people are interested in following up, feel free to drop me an email anytime. So thanks so much, great. Anthony. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, our next George Talks will be in July. Uh, Professor Christine Jenkins, who's the head of the respiratory group at the George, will be uh, examining COVID-19 and other related topics. Um, so please keep an eye on the George Institute's website and uh, social media for registration details. But um, thanks once again, Andrew, for a fascinating talk and, um, and goodbye all. Thank you. <laughs>